I came to Oxford in 1976 to do a DPhil with Peter Slight, and uh, we designed a trial to look at beta blockers in acute MI with a grand sample size of 100. Now, if you ask me how did we calculate it, it sounded like a good number. <laughs> and uh, after about 50 people, in which we measured, as Oliver Omrod remembers, 35 lead ECG maps every six hours, and after one and a half years, we had 45 patients. And then I visited Sweden, and Lars uh, Wilhelmsel's here, who were doing a much bigger study of 1,500 people, and they said, go and talk to Richard Peter about designing trials. And I said, who Peter? And he said, and I said, where is he? And he said, he's in your building. <laughs> so I came back and rang Richard and said, uh, sir, I was still, I had my Indian deference still. Uh, I, I said, I need to talk to you. My study isn't going well. And I'm trying to do my DPhil. I've spent half my time. So he said, go away. I don't have time for you. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then I said, no, sir, please, I need to talk to you. So he said, OK, I'll give you 15 minutes. Those 15 minutes are still counting 40 years later. <laughs> and I remember two things from the study. Um, and I agreed to everything. You know, later on, he said, Salim, you're one of the few people who argues with me. But, uh, and he said two things. You've got to get it much bigger, and you've got to make it much simpler. And he helped me redesign it completely. The other thing that I remember him telling me was, I don't care about your DPhil. All I care is that you do something useful. But those were important messages. It wasn't out of... Uh, lack of uh, anything. Anyway, over the years, we then went on to do a small elegant study of 480 people with two centers collaborating that got published in reputable journals, and it had a benefit on ECG changes and enzyme changes and a significant reduction mortality, nominally significant. So I told Richard, we've proven it, let's use it. He said, no, now you do the real experiment. Now this paper that Rory, Richard, and I wrote is about six or seven years of dialogue and discussion. This paper had only a measly 45 drafts and was a masterpiece. The first and foremost, ask an important question, and second, answer it reliably. That sentence was written and rewritten dozens and dozens of times. That is vintage Richard writing with a piece of paper and a pencil. And I don't know whether he still does it. This then set me off. Uh, to do various things. I did my clinical training in medicine and then in cardiology and then got a position at the NIH. Uh, I was uh, invited to work on the first large heart failure program in the world. It wasn't necessarily heart large, but they had a ton of money. And the usual trial in heart failure was 200 or so people. The biggest trial in those days was the VHEFT first of about 550 people with three arms. And I had just come out brash from my cardiology training and brash from having worked with Richard. And I had to persuade the United States that we were going to do a trial 10 times larger. And the only way we could do that was a clever trick. We said the main trial is going to be ultra simple, four pages of data collection, which you will know in the US is an anathema. But we also said we will do seven little elegant sub-studies where we can study whatever widget you want to use. We call them sub-studies, and they truly did inform us as well. So this study showed that an ACE inhibitor reduced mortality in people with heart failure and low ejection fraction, and it prevented people uh, getting into heart failure and being re-hospitalized. We did something new. We did a parallel study in people with pre-heart failure, that is low ejection fraction. And for those of you who don't know, the heart pumps a certain amount of blood out with each beat, and usually it's about 55% or more, and we call low under 35%. And here we found that although there was a big effect on preventing uh, development of heart failure, there was very modest effect on preventing death. But many years later, after I moved from NIH to, the, uh, to, the, to McMaster, I knew that study needed to go longer. So we did, through a variety of means, record linkage. And this is the treatment trial where the benefits continued. But then by the time we got to 12 years, 70% of people had died in both groups. But contrast that with what happened to the prevention trial. We only had an absolute difference of 2% at the end of the trial, 
no more treatments of both groups weren't well treated equally, it doubled to 4%, and by the time we got to 12 years, it increased by 6%. And so what I learned from this, that is in lower risk individual, trials had to be much longer than we usually uh, designed them, and long-term uh, follow-up would have been, would be, was useful. But we also asked the question, had we really treated these people longer, would we have gotten a bigger effect? I rather suspect we would. Now, moving to McMaster, I was determined to show that ACE inhibitors also had an effect in preventing heart attacks. In the SOL trials, there was a reduction in heart attack. In the SAVE trial done by Mark Pfeffer, there was a reduction in heart attack. But the FDA said, no, we won't approve it. I had to prove it. So we set up the HOPE study in people without heart failure, 9,000 people. This study only cost about 18 million Canadian in those days, which in real money, that's monopoly money, in real money is about 14 million or so US. And we saw a huge, a very clear reduction in uh, heart attacks, strokes, and deaths, a clear reduction in deaths, MI, strokes, neutral effect on non-CB deaths, and 16%. And the surprising thing was in these people who weren't necessarily hypertensive, there was only a three and a half millimeter reduction in blood pressure, which meant, if this was true, that the majority of effects was through non-blood pressure related mechanisms. So, but we had also factored in vitamin E. I mean, what uh, Michael Brown didn't say was an equally important result of HPS was the neutral effects of vitamin E, the antioxidants, and we had tested vitamin E and there was a neutral effect using a factorial design. And the lessons I took from it was factorial designs were, were efficient to test simple generic interventions like vitamin E that nobody funds. So about 50% of our trials today involve factorial designs. The other thing we learned is you can do lots of trials and if you don't get trials with positive results, people stop funding you. So we were lucky to have got a trial that was positive. In parallel with that, I had worked on the ISIS trials with Rory, Richard, and Peter Slight, who I hope will be here this evening. Uh, and so we continued the tradition of acute MI, acute coronary syndrome trials. And over the years, we've done two, 12 such trials in about 40 countries on a total of about 140,000 people. And it did, many of them did have an positive results and it had an influence on science, uh, on, on practice. But this is the trial that is my most favorite. This started off as a boring trial. It started off by looking at a new agent, fondaparinex versus enoxaparin. And fondaparinex is a tiny pentasaccharide that binds to antithrombin, and then it changes the receptor configuration, and 10A binds to it. This is the coagulation pathway. There's the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway, and 10A is key. And that should therefore be quite effective. And the fondaparinex then gets released and you can go back and cycle it. So this was the design, 20,000 people with acute coronary syndromes, half to fondaparinex, half to enoxaparin, the most widely used antithrombotic then in the field. And we had a primary endpoint of death, myocardial infarction, and refractory ischemia two days after the end of treatment, bleeds, and deaths. And what did we find? This was a non-inferiority trial. So we cried victory. You know, no difference between the two treatments out at nine days. But this was the interesting finding, a 50% reduction in uh, bleeding with fondaparinex compared to enoxaparin. Uh, and it translated into a, about a fifth reduction in mortality. So similar effect on efficacy, but a major difference in safety, and that's translating into mortality reduction. And this has started to influence the field, where now just bashing the thrombus isn't enough. You've got to balance it with safety. Now, the other analysis we did, which is a simple numbers analysis, which Richard taught me. Just look at the architecture of the data. And we, when you look at deaths at 180 days, there were 64 fewer deaths. No difference in those who did not bleed. The entire difference, 95% of the difference, came from the people who bled. Richard once told me, if you do a good trial, you don't need statisticians. The results have to be obvious by themselves. 
So that was one of them. And the lessons we learned was avoiding bleeding was just as important as preventing ischemic events. And since then, Rob and I and others have been involved in trials with the new oral anticoagulants. And they have been found not only to be more effective, they've actually been found to be safer as well. For instance, there's a 65% reduction in intracerebral bleeds with these new agents. And as they go off patent, these will be used widely worldwide. Now, my passion, because I'm from India, was working in neglected diseases. And I discussed this with Richard many, many times. And he's always said, start with the disease burden. But that doesn't work out often if you know, opportunities present itself. We've done many observational studies, and I'm not going to talk about that. It includes the interheart, the interstroke, uh, and the peer study. But I'm going to talk about the trials we did in neglected uh, conditions. We did TB pericarditis. It has a 50% one-year mortality rate in the people who get the condition. Because when they get it, there is fluid around the heart, and then it constricts, and both of them kill people, especially if you're living in a pl place where you have no access to health care. So Bongani Mayosi from Cape Town, in, along with 18 other centers in Africa, it was a really tough study to do. Uh, we did the study, factorial design with steroids, which was the standard therapy and TB vaccine. Both were ineffective, although steroids prevented vasoconstriction, uh, but they substantially increased HIV cancers. The previous trials, of steroids was 180 people in the pre-HIV re re region, and we had something like 16 cancers versus two cancers. Now you'd say they aren't, they aren't big numbers, but, but in the context of lack of efficacy, that was enough to change practice. I'm going to talk a little bit about Chagas disease where we've invested over 10 years of work, and uh, I'll briefly mention rheumatic uh, valve disease is one of the biggest pure, curable heart diseases in the world affects about 400,000 people die a year. Most of the deaths are in people under 25, and most of those are preventable. Uh, and we have a program of a large registry of 20,000 people, and registries can teach you a lot. And in that, what we found is that the commonest recommendations is to give penicillin to prevent recurrence. But what we're finding is recurrent acute rheumatic fever is only 1% per year. But the commonest cause of death is heart failure, which is 8% per year. And the uh, valvuloplasties of surgery that people need just isn't happening in sub-Saharan Africa, and happening more in South Asia. We've also managed to do, uh, got a trial called Invictus going on, on 4,500 people with valve disease and atrial fibrillation, thanks to Bayer, due to their corporate social responsibility. That trial is halfway through. Compared to the usual therapy, or uh, warfarin, and the problem in Africa is warfarin control is terrible. Uh, I, uh, you know, labs are far away. People have to walk a day to get these things done. And so this trial is ongoing. And the centers that are participating are among the better centers. Yet INR control isn't great. We are, uh, polypill has been one of my passions. And we've done two phase two trials to find the right dosing and combination and they were published in the Lancet in circulation. And now, thanks to the Wellcome Trust, we have a large trial in high-risk primary prevention, which I hope will report in about two years. And hopefully, if it's possible, Tom Friedem might want to take the polypill into his program. Now, Chagas disease, and this is the last part of my talk, and this has, has left me confused. For those of who don't know what Chagas disease is, it's caused by trypanosome, uh, trypanosoma cruzi, which is like the same family of organism that causes syphilis. And it's endemic in parts of South America, affects 8 million people. Its acute infection resolves in 50%. What it is, there's a bug in the roof, and it falls on people, uh, defecates on people, bites them, and rubs the, the, the feces into people, and the stuff gets in. There's an acute phase where you can have something called Romano sign where the eye swells, but then mostly it resolves, but one in three people in the chronic phase get cardiomyopathy, and one in six people get dysfunction of the gut called uh, megacolon. Anyway, uh, in the acute phase, bensnitazole, the only marketed drug for Chagas disease, is very effective. 
But in the chronic phase, there's no evidence, and people sort of assumed that it would work. And there were data that in the chronic phase, if you did PCR, you can identify the bug in the blood. So we set up a study of nearly 3,000 people from 50 sites in five countries. Half came from Brazil, half came from four other countries. We had a local coordinating center in Brazil. We had to set up PCR collabs. This is the biggest PCR effort in Chagas disease there. And uh, the study, unfortunately, with a mean of nearly six years of follow-up, did not show a clear difference. We had also a careful echo study because you would affect, think that the ventricular function would be affected, and there was no impact. But the study generated controversy because we were going against the tide and saying the only treatment that's available doesn't work. And to add to that, there were subgroup analyses. And this is the subgroup analysis on PCR negativization by country. Colombia or Salvador, Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia. Now, in Colombia and Salvador, type 5 uh, bug is the commonest bug, and you have high parasite loads. In Brazil, type 2 is commoner, and the parasite loads are lower. And Argentina and Bolivia is in between. And as you'll see, in Colombia and Salvador, you know, with rather good numbers for PCR, there's no effect. There's a very big effect in Brazil and an intermediate effect in, in Argentina and Bolivia. And this is the p-value for interaction. So no matter what you say, that's a pretty impressive subgroup analysis on the PCRs. So when we looked at clinical events, actually, we partly saw something that mirrored it. In Brazil, there's a nominally significant reduction in the primary endpoint. And in other countries, there wasn't. This is the outlier, because you would have expected some benefit there, but we didn't see it. And this led to two years of debate in writing the paper. The Brazilians said it works in Brazil. Everybody else says you've got to look at the overall result. Now, we said, look, you know, the analysis by country is crude because parasites don't carry passports. So if you think they had, uh, they matter, then let's do genotyping. So right now we are genotyping the parasites from the stored blood and we'll repeat the subgroup analysis to see what happens. We have, are now thinking of a new trial with multiple cycles of benzmidazole because what we gave was 60 days of treatment only. It, this may be like TB. You may have to give prolonged treatment or like chemotherapy. So we are experimenting with that idea. We evaluated newer trypanosidal therapies like posoconazole. They seem to be very effective acutely, less side effects, they, the benefits can persist long term. So, and we did combination as well. And maybe in chronic disease, we need therapies that aim the myocardium rather than the bug alone. Now, over the 40 years I've collaborated with Richard, there are many things I've learned, and I hope I put some of those to use. That is, start with disease burden. Now, I didn't quite do that. I took the opportunities and worked on it. Get the big picture right and get every detail right. Now, in a sense, that's what everybody here said in, in different presentations. Place the results in context. Your trial is not alone. Uh, put them in the entire context. Incidentally, that large, simple trial paper that Richard Rory and I wrote actually had all the key principles on how you do a meta-analysis. You know, and also the first two papers that we wrote, which I haven't shown you, beta blockade and streptokinase were the first two proper systematic overviews in the field. Tom Chalmers had done pooling where you add up the events on the two groups, but this was the first time proper uh, methodology was used. And obviously Richard has taken it further in the breast cancer area and Colin Page and others in the lipid lowering and uh, antiplatelet. The other thing he kept on reminding me is, your study must be the definitive word on the issue. It must be so large, it drowns everything else out. Now, he tried to do that with vitamin A, with the study he did in India, with Shelley Avasti, and it is by far the biggest in the literature. Uh, there is some controversy, because the results were different from the rest, but, you know, um, what can I say? I believe Richard went in doubt. Uh, then, 
He also said unanticipated qualitative interactions are rare. This is the hardest one for those of us in clinical trials to accept. You have to almost believe it like a mantra. And to, by and large, I tend to believe it, except when I see results like the benzodiazole. Uh, uh, results that we saw, maybe there is something there based on the genotype of the strain. We don't know that yet. And so I will say the last 40 years with Richard has been nothing but a miracle. It's been a miracle in many ways. It's wonderful to see the impact of what he himself has done. It's even more fantastic to see the impact he's done through the people he's mentored, like Rory, me, um, John Dinesh, so many other people who are here, and they're multiplied. And I've also had a personal minor miracle over the last 40 years. I was very ill at a time in Oxford, and Richard, Rory, Peter, and others were strong friends and got me through. Uh, thank you for both the signs, and thank you for the personal support and comfort. Thank you very much. <laughs>